Adam Savage from Tested, and I am in a very special location right now. I'm at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in downtown San Francisco, outside an exhibit called Far Out, about space habitats, spaceships, and our conception of what space might be like and what it is like. Now, if you're like the average person, you probably don't get to a museum as often as you'd like, and I exhort you to do that. Museums aren't just places where they show important things from culture. It's actually a place where we as a culture talk about ourselves. Curator Joseph Becker is gonna take me on a conversational tour of Far Out and it's gonna begin right here with Tom Sachs' beautiful spacesuit. Well, Joseph, you knew we were gonna start with this. My friend Tom Sachs' amazing work. It's the front piece to the show. That's right. So talk to me about why it's the front piece and what it means to the, to the exhibit. So here we have Tom's suit. Uh, it's actually called Mary's Suit, which is a really nice connection to SFMOMA. Uh, That's Mary, Mary in Areno. Mary in Areno, who works at SFMOMA, also worked for Tom Sachs. So this was a suit made to fit her body. She was one um, of the astronauts when he did space program at Europa Buena Center for the Arts. That's right, Yeah, the Europa mission. Um, so the exhibition, Far Out, Suits, Habs, and Labs for Outer Space, looks at designs and artistic responses to uh, fitting out the human body in space in a way. It also thinks about what our kind of social and cultural response has been to space and how we've developed a collective aesthetic around space travel. And so all of this is about this relationship between artists and engineers, designers and scientists, and how there's a reciprocal relationship between the two. So Tom's work is really kind of crucial to that. It's yeah. an intersection between science uh, and art. And there's, there's an aspect to it, like I was obsessed with space for decades before I realized truly that a spacesuit is simply a spaceship that's in the shape of your body. That's right. But Tom's work says that like a flag in the ground, it is yeah. so clearly a piece of architecture for the body. Yeah. In a way that is, seems to me to be like rarely extant so much on the surface of a thing. In a way you get to see the register of his hand as it's been created. So you're called attention to the efforts to put all of these materials together. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in some of the other spacesuits that you've so dutifully created, some of that effort is hidden. You know, it's kind of like, how do we, how do we make sense of this incredible feat? Well, here we can see the tape, we can see the rivets, we can see all of the different details. And the, the, the truth is actually, when you visit NASA archives and you handle original pieces of equipment, you can see the maker's mark and the hands and the fingerprints and the oil on them. And yeah. it's really clear these are made by people. Well, I, I really love to use Tom as an example for this. Again, this intersection between the art as a response, but also as an initiating uh, avenue um, for inspiration here. So Tom has said that you know he wanted to be an astronaut when he was young, but he realized he didn't have necessarily the dedication or the attention span to go through the, yeah. the rigorous training and the science and the math. Um, so eventually he just decided to create his own space program. You know, And, and I think we've discussed this idea yeah. with Tom about sympathetic magic that if you make it, it is real. You, know, you, you make it become true. So instead of going through the government sanctioned avenue of, of becoming an astronaut, he just created his own avenue yeah. and became his own astronaut. And so that is something that I think is, is really important because it shows how you harness the imagination, how you harness the inspiration. Um, and so as a kind of a front piece to the exhibition, it says to our visitors, you too can become an astronaut. You know, if, if you are dedicated um, to, to chasing down this inspiration. Um, and, it, and it really shows this kind of confluence of are the artists in response to, or are the artists generating? And I think it's very much both. Well, it's a conversation. Yeah. That's thrilling. It, there's a way in which this tells you everything you need to know about what's actually going on in the real space program. Yeah. Right? Like everything is actually here and extant. It's just so clear yep. how it was built and what it was built for yep. that it's much more accessible. It's fully functioning with additional functionality. Oh, right, right. It's got a full integral cooling system. It's got cooling a cooling system. system. It's got the thermal layer, but it also has a shotgun and a knife. Just in case, <laughs> you know, on your mission to another planet, you uh, uh, encounter hostile entities. Okay. Shall we move into yeah, the uh, exhibit room? Okay. 
So while Tom's work is a, is a visualization of, of space as it is, um, on this wall here are a bunch of visualizations of space as it could be. Is that yeah. a reasonable uh, way yeah. of describing it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, it, we're talking about this, this kind of intersection between the imagination and the real. Um, so these are paintings that were done by Rick Guidis, who's an artist and an architect um, based down in Los Gatos. And they were, um, they were essentially requested as illustrations for this NASA-sponsored seminar, bringing together scientists and engineers, imagining what the future of space would be. And this is in 1976, to, to figure out how to put 10,000 people into space. Wow. So these, Physicists and these engineers and astrophysicists were all kind of coming together to imagine how do you create self-sustaining uh, ecosystems and, yeah. and how like what are the structures going to be? How do you how do you create gravity? And these ideas were being drawn and illustrated by people trained as artists. Right. And that result are these paintings, which were essentially used to sell the public on the idea that we could go into space. What I love about this is, I mean, you can't build anything without being able to visualize it. Yeah. And, you know, we grow up thinking of something as giant and inconceivable as a space program, as something other people do. But it's lovely to see that it all begins here with a, with a, a little bit of a kind of a virus in someone's brain about what's possible. Totally. And but, that spreads far and wide. So this is sponsored by NASA, this is, you know, um, So this totally is them understanding rooted. the virtual cycle, really wanting to generate excitement and interest and also push the envelope of what people think is possible. Exactly, and generate funding too from Congress right. oh, okay. because it had to sell the idea in order for the space program to be, you know, this is hot on the heels of landing on the moon. How do you keep going after right. spending such a huge- Right, Apollo was only three years wrapped at that point. Yeah, right? yeah. essentially, yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at a kind of a Larry Niven ring world idea yes. here. Yes, yes. So we've got ring worlds, and that's this other thing, that, that the intersection of what NASA is suggesting is possible yeah. is being rendered by these artists, artists and then um, the, the, the relationship between what is science fact and what is science fiction is so gray. Yeah. Because we look at this and we say, oh, we've, we've seen this in, in ring world, we've mm -hmm, seen mm -hmm. this in, in all of these different aspects of science fiction, these rotating, worlds that are, you know, Kubrick's 2001 Space Station yeah, 5 also yeah. in the show, and all of these other things that we see in all of these different films all kind of come from the actual physics, the actual science. Right, so these, these are not super, these aren't fanciful in terms of, well, some type of, quote, magic makes it possible. These, right. these are all as fanciful and as big as they are, they're all within the realm of physics for human beings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It's probably not within the realm of funding, <laughs> but, but it's there, also, it's, you know, the whole idea, especially in, in images like this, that we would have giant space stations holding 10,000 people that would be filled with these bucolic landscapes. Right. I mean, this is completely fanciful. Yeah. Like, that, that's not what space is it's, really going to look we're gonna like, go, but it looks fine. It we're looks gonna great. We're going to go all the way to space and make the suburbs. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, especially in some of these other ones, Oh, That's exactly wow. what it is. Oh, look at that. There's a cocktail party Complete up Complete with a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> their, their, their color is amazing. They mm -hmm. seem to have been really well preserved and cared for. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. What's next? There's so much to look at. Okay, for some reason, I, this was here when we loaded in? I, t tell me about it. It's, I have so many questions about this. So this is a work, it's a sculpture by the artist Tavares Strawn, mm -hmm. who's from the Bahamas, but based in New York. And a lot of his work deals with kind of rewriting narratives of historically uh, underrepresented demographics, so okay. including the Bahamas. And like Tom Sachs, Tavares was always interested in, in going to space or becoming an astronaut. Uh, and he actually went through the, the cosmonaut program oh, wow. in Russia. Um, so he's a cosmonaut. And then he, <laughs> he uh, set up his own space program as well in the Bahamas called BASEC, which is the Bahamas Air and Space Exploration Center. So Amazing. it's kind of an education yeah. center for, um, for people living in the Bahamas and giving them access and tools. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a sculpture that's called Finding My Way Home, and it's both an exploding astronaut and an astronaut whose components are kind of coming together. So it's a little bit of a, of a narrative of, of what is the icon of the astronaut and who gets to be an astronaut. Wow.
Joseph, there are three uh, space stations hanging from the ceiling here. This one looks really familiar. How come? So this is actually, this one has a great story. This is Island One, which is, it's called a Bernal Sphere, which mm -hmm. is one of the three typologies that was determined in this NASA program that we were talking about. So if we look on the other side of the room, we've got oh, those yeah. paintings by Rick Guidas. There is the... And there's the painting of the Bernal Sphere. Amazing. So this is a kind of an inverted sphere. So all the, the occupiable space is facing inward as opposed to our Earth where we're obviously facing outward. Okay. Um, but the, it, it is also um, on the two sides of that sphere, there are these agricultural rings and that would be imagined to make all of the supplies and the food for the inhabitants. And then there are solar reflectors bringing the sun in. I see. Uh, uh, and and th this was just, you know, as we were talking about the paintings um, from NASA, this was also a discovery of something that I thought was far gone. Really? And when we found it, it had been uh, probably disassembled since the 1970s. So it was one of those things, as, as, um, as curators, we sometimes have to negotiate the condition of work and bring in our conservation staff to do some, some work, sometimes extensive. And our conservation team did an incredible job pulling these pieces back together and, and recreating this object, essentially. It's really beautiful. I mean, yeah. and that's a genuine piece of spun aluminum is that outer ring held by wires. That yeah. is a very delicate piece. Yeah. And it's nice to have this piece in juxtaposition to the model that we have of Stanley Kubrick's Space Station 5, which again is one of these ring worlds that, you know, right. the, this right. um, 70s study articulates as, as viable for gravity. Now, this is the most iconic image that many people remember from 2001, and this is built yeah. by my friend Steve Neal, actually. Yeah, it's, and you put me in touch with Steve it is, uh, to create this model for the show. It's so gorgeous, yeah. and I love that he's got the Pan Am uh, space liner heading in, yeah. in, into it, like the poster. Yeah, it's, it's an incredible object, and again, as, as we were talking about earlier, the show is a little bit about how we have formed a collective uh, aesthetic, how we understand space travel and what it looks like. And Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey is like one of the most important avenues for the transmission of space imagery. Isn't that far out? It's incredible. Um, and so this ring world, this you know space station that's orbiting, that's creating artificial gravity, yeah. that essentially informs the Rick Guidas paintings in the NASA study. And yeah, that comes right. from um, this, you know, the earlier Collier's magazines illustrated by Chesley Bonasso. And all of these things are connected through the hand of the artist, also through the hand of science and engineering. It, the lesson I always take from talking to you and coming to museums and looking at shows is that we always think that in our houses, in our opinions, in our minds, the way we think about things doesn't really matter. But collectively, it joins together and does actually create entire realities, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, Kubrick, uh, you know, this is 1968. We hadn't even landed on the moon yet. Right. And the, the inspiration and the questioning that come out of this film affects all these other generations, generations of astronauts, generations of, of designers, generations of Imagineers, <laughs> yeah. you know, as yourself. And he was working with NASA engineers. He was trying to be really rigorous about the science. He was trying to present a genuinely viable, yeah. uh, a reasonable approach to space exploration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, you know, this is what I think of as what's the next thing that should be possible. It's, it's incredible. He was so particular about trying to get the science right in the film. And one of the pieces that we actually don't have on view is a marked up script from Graphic Films, which was an outfit in Los Angeles that was helping kind of design some of the sets for the Clavius moon base and mm -hmm. all of these things based on the physics as known. Um, and the marked up script says, no, this, you know, entry velocity is going to be different. This is, a, you know, a different set of math that you have to use to get this. The, the lighting angle has to be different because this is the radiation from the sun. All these different things are noted in this script and Kubrick was, you know, very diligent to make sure that the film looked as accurate as possible. I, I wanted to tell you that astronaut Chris Hadfield told me that if you did actually have to work on one of these, mm -hmm. the transition from being in the outer ring 
to the inner core where there was no gravity, yeah. artificial gravity being created, um, would be really, really hard on the astronauts' bodies. Yeah, I can only be, imagine. Because they'd be repeatedly enduring the transition between gravity and a lack of gravity, which yeah. is the worst part, apparently, about space travel. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can imagine you'd get a little nauseated. Okay, well, we knew we were going to end up here in mm -hmm. this beautiful circle of spacesuits and equipment. Uh, and some of these are mine, and we'll talk about them. But mm -hmm. this one blew my mind when we were loading in. It is so incredible. Talk, talk to me about this piece. So this is a work, so on, on this platform, we have both you know, hypothetical spacesuits and real spacesuits. Um, but this is a work that really tells an important story. Uh, and it's a project by Christina de Midel, um, who's a Spanish artist, based on the story of the Afronauts, which is a true story about the Zambian space program. So she's created a spacesuit out of the Omeco uh, fabric and kind of put together with a little bit of duct tape, kind of a, a really rudimentary approach to creating a spacesuit. But the real story is that in the 1960s, there was um, a Zambian space program with the efforts to really be the first nation in space. Wow. Without the funding, right. certainly without necessarily the technology, but enough effort so that they, uh, they got far enough to have a young female astronaut and a whole program that would bring her and her two cats into <laughs> space. You know, fantastical, but also a very interesting uh, program that allows us to question who space has been for right. and how certain, you know, big global players or big corporate players now uh, have taken control. Yeah. Uh, so this this asks us to reconsider who space is for. Well, I also I find it fascinating because there's such a connection to Tom's work here, yeah. and yet I feel much more like this is something that I want to put on right away. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Like this looks it looks cozy. Mm -hmm. It looks welcoming and warm in a way that almost nothing else in this room has a feeling about. Yeah. It's it's really lovely. It's ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, as we yeah. proceed counterclockwise, obviously some familiar pieces, my yeah. Mercury suit. But this one, this is a real Gemini suit. Yeah, this it, is. I didn't realize I'd get to see one of these when, I, when we loaded in. I was super thrilled. And in fact, yeah. I'll tell you, when we first walked in, I looked into the suits and I looked at the boots and I was like, huh, did someone replace my boots? I don't remember those boots. And then I looked up and I was like, oh, that's not my suit. <laughs> so we, we almost borrowed one from you, but... Um, we did get the opportunity to borrow a real test flight suit from the Gemini program from NASA Ames. So this is a 1965 test suit. It means that it was used for testing, but not for flight. Okay. Um, and this was really great. We, we had a long uh, dialogue with NASA, certainly interested in anything related to the Apollo program because mm -hmm. it's the 50th anniversary. And they basically said, no, anything Apollo is off limits because we've got all of our resources dedicated to celebrating that through the NASA yes. um, avenues and, and the Air and Space Museum. But this Gemini suit was available. And it's so interesting to look at this. You see so many different details that they're thinking through. This is 1965. And you see materiality, the boots, which just look like boots. They're lace-ups. They've got a zipper. And then they're laced into the leg. So this was, this was really exciting to see. And it's, I, it's got this beautiful patina too. It has an amazing patina. I, I, I took some pictures of it when I was first here. Um, one of the things I love most about it is how hand done the stitching around each of the couplers yeah. uh, really, really is. Yeah. I mean, that's just a person going, oh yeah, that'll do. <laughs> and even, even the patch, the NASA patch looks handmade. Yeah. You've got my uh, 2001 spacesuit here. I think this is probably one of my favorite objects in the show. Really? I have to say. I mean, I have always been inspired by Kubrick's film, but the way that the, the body is designed, especially in the, the scenes around the Clavius moon base and the discovery of the monolith, is so great. The shape of the helmet feels like it's projecting us into the future, but it also has this kind of retro aesthetic that is, it's so approachable. The use of silver in the suit mm -hmm. um, and the kind of the quilting, I think it's a beautiful object. And, and the fact that you've made this is so exciting. 
Uh, one of the things that I found most enjoyable about this was as we were putting together the front pack, uh, Mike Scott, who built the front pack and sewed the soft parts of the suit, uh, is the writing here mm -hmm. on the front pack is actually the legalese writing from the lower right-hand corner of Letraset, which was the <laughs> rub down text. Yeah. This is a great thing that you might do in film. You, you need something there, right. just pff, it doesn't you, matter. No one's going to read it. You'll never read it, yeah. <laughs> Well, I noticed that. <laughs> the other thing about the film, um, which is so nice to have the suit here because we can talk about it, is that it, it um, anticipates technology in such an interesting way. Obviously, a lot of the film is about artificial intelligence, but in the film you see iPads, you mm -hmm, see mm -hmm. wearables. And this IBM wrist computer, yeah. you know, here we are in 1968 and everybody in 2019 is walking around with an Apple Watch. And I think it's, it's just so interesting to think about artists like Stanley Kubrick imagining how are we going to enter into the future. I specifically remember being in grade school in the 70s and having a book about NASA's future and seeing suits that looked exactly like this mm -hmm. with the convolutes built all the way up the arms and mm -hmm. all the way down the legs. So that it was flexible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was their idea about how that was going to work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we have a, a, a early model EMU suit from, uh, this is my replication of, I think, uh, late 80s, mid so to late 80s. This thing is incredible that, that you've <laughs> built this, Adam, and I, uh, we're, we're not really allowed to touch anything, but you can just flip those lights on, and there's so much functionality that you've built into this object. It's also about 200 pounds, so it's like <laughs> legitimately a, a substantial uh, spacesuit, and I believe you've worn it and walked around. I have it? worn it and I've walked around, and I'll tell you that the main body of the suit is actually built by NASA's education department in the 80s. So it is, uh, I don't think it's officially beta cloth, but it is a Teflon coated nylon, uh -huh. so it feels quite authentic. I had the gloves built, the helmets from a different uh, different space, and I did some accuratizing of the of the chess piece from some other parts of my collection. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, this was maybe the one I spent the most time on leading up to your show in order to get all the little details correct. And you see the, the lettering here is all backwards so that you can, as an astronaut, see it in the reflection? Yeah, in the wrist mirror. Mm -hmm. And uh, in each of these, when you, when you see how much it go, goes into strapping a spaceship onto your body, yeah. it physicalizes the experience, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's the whole, that, the, the physicalization of it, if we can say that, is that's the whole purpose of doing an exhibition. You walk in, you see this object that you know maybe you haven't seen in person, yeah. you've seen an image of, and you get a sense of the scale, and you form a new relationship with what efforts have gone into creating it, what it stands for, what its functionality could be. You know? There's a way in which being in the room with the thing is, it's always better. It's like you can look at any picture of a Jackson Pollock that you want, as big as you want, but standing yeah. in front of the real thing is... You gotta see the real thing. Yeah. Joseph, I thank you so much for taking me on a tour through here. This well, this is, it's been amazing, Adam. I mean, we, we've got four of your incredible spacesuits that you've done so much to create, and you've shown incredible passion. And this is something, you know, obviously the space program has continued to inspire you, and that's what, that's what we're all about here. Oh, it's, it's an amazing exhibit. Thank you, man.